Okay, good morning, everyone. All right, let's begin this time with prayer, and then we'll get into chapter 6. That's where we'll start from. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, Lord, and uh, even as we've come together to learn and to study your word, we pray, God, that you will bring meaning, you will bring revelation, minister to our spirits, O God, and everything that we learn, O God, help us to apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we went into chapter, last class we did chapter 5, right? Chapter 5 was ask leading questions, learn to ask important questions, don't ask foolish questions, don't ask questions just because you have to ask questions, right? but ask leading questions, questions that will give you opportunities to bring in the gospel, right? So we looked at many uh, different aspects there. But from chapter 6, we'll need to pick up a little bit of pace. So I'll go a little fast um, so that we'll be able to cover the portions for this semester. OK, so now we're going to talk about invite and pray. I'm sure most of us do this, right? We invite people to church. We invite people to ministry. We invite people to life groups, wherever. But let's look at the scriptures and see the importance of inviting people and praying for them, right? Let's read John chapter 1, verse 35 to 39. Now, before we read that, uh, let me get a picture of what's happening now. This is John the Baptist. Talking about John the Baptist, now, John the Baptist is already famous, right? He's got disciples. He's been baptizing people in the River Jordan. And now, Jesus comes. Everyone are asking, John's disciples are asking, who do we follow? Do we follow you or this new person named Jesus who's coming and he's saying he's the Messiah? What do we do? We don't know what to do. Now, this is what, this is the passage. This is the reply that John the Baptist gives. Let's read. Chapter 1, verse 35, uh, and I'll stop you. I'll stop you in between if I have to. 35 through 39. And the next day. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, Who do you want? What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew and Simon, Peter's brother, was on of the two who heard what John and had said and okay. who had followed Jesus. Yeah, let's stop there. Right. Now we see a picture here. You've got John, his disciples, and when they saw Jesus, the disciples asked, you know, who's this new person? You know, he's saying he's Jesus, and they followed Jesus. Now, later on, John himself, so one of the disciples was Andrew, that's uh, Peter's brother. Now, the first point here, when John the Baptist's disciples left John, John pointed people to Jesus. Right? Later on, we see that John said, I am nothing. I told you, somebody is coming after me who's greater than me, whose sandals I'm even unworthy to untie. So the first point, pointing people based on trust. How does that work? Andrew and the other disciples of John trusted John the Baptist. Right. So when John said, you can go and follow Jesus because he is the Lamb of God. He is the one who has come to take away the sins of the world. He is the Messiah. They believed in him and they followed him. Now, what would have happened if they didn't believe in John the Baptist? What if there was no trust? We don't know. what They may have gone another way itself. But here we see they trusted John the Baptist. And when John said, follow Jesus, they followed Jesus. Right now, two of his disciples, based on simple trust that they had in John, 
left John and went and followed Jesus. Simple trust. Everyone say that. Simple trust. Now, here's the thing about trust. Trust is something that is gained over time. Yes? How many of you have had friends, you tell them to come, I want to meet you at 11 o'clock, they'll come at 12 o'clock. How many of you have had friends of, you know, meeting starts at 11 o'clock, but the meeting starts at 12 o'clock? Hey, what is this 11 o'clock it says? Yeah, that is for the believers. Unbelievers come at 12 o'clock. That's foolish. We need to learn to build people's trust. And trust is built over time. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes time to build trust. Yes? Right? So now when you and I are ministering to people, build trust. Now it can be simple. That's why the word simple is there. Simple trust. If you say you want to meet somebody at 10 o'clock, you better be there at 9.50. Yes or no? Right. Now, if you're going there at uh, 10 o'clock and trying to figure out where to sit, something is wrong. You've got to learn to develop trust. People should be able to trust in you. Now, it comes over time. I'm not saying it's going to happen immediately. right? So, for example, there are some friends that I have. Right? They're not believers. They're people from different faiths. And... If I tell them, come for this meeting, youth meeting, or come for this conference, they will come. Now, the reason they'll come is because now they know everything. It's Christian about Jesus. They may be singing, clapping, all of it. They know all of it. They're not believers. But when I, if I tell them, come, they'll come. Why? Because over the years, I have built a certain relationship with them. I've built trust. Right now, I'm not forcing them. You have to become a believer. You have to read the word. You have to pray. Otherwise, you'll go to hell. All those things. Are, I'm not saying any of that. Say. So, for example, is uh, worship night. If I invite them, they will come. Because they know that hey, Paul is not going to force me. And I don't know what's happening in the worship night. Others may force me. To become a believer but one thing is paul is calling me he, he will not force me and if i want to leave also i can go to paul and tell him i want to leave he'll be fine with it what's happening here i have built trust now even in family if you look at it in our own family we need to build trust right in our own family if it's as you grow up as teenagers parents begin to look at their children, they're growing. Children want to gain the trust of their parents. Yeah. Even Not even teenagers, even kids. You know, say, hey, what did you do in school? I did this. But then I did also something wrong. This is something wrong that I did. Why do they do that? Because they want to build the trust of the parents. So that later on, the parents will understand, OK, he's somebody who I believe. You get what I'm saying? Right? So number one, pointing based on trust. The Lord Jesus welcomes them and reveals who he is to them. Andrew is one of them. Remember they asked Jesus, where do you stay? Good question. Jesus said, straight, take the second right, take the first left. Did he say that? What did he say? Come and see. They went and they saw. They came out of that house knowing that he was the Messiah. And Andrew was one of the 12 disciples who stayed on till the end. Right? There are times, because of the trust we have developed, we can point people to Jesus. Second one, John chapter 1, 40 and 42. Sharing based on common need or common search or a common interest. Let's read that. One John 1, two, 40 to 42. One of two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. 
he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, and he brought him to the Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah, and you shall be called Siphaz. Yeah, let's stop there. Now, what's happening during this time? You see, it's been 400 years of silence, 400 years of no prophetic word. All of a sudden, John the Baptist comes into the picture, and now the Jews are waiting for the Messiah. Now, the picture for the Jews is the Messiah will come on a horse with mighty power and strength. He will come as a king. He will defeat the Roman government. And he will help us to rule over the entire nation. That is the picture that the Jews have. Right? So all the Jews, if you and I were Jews living during that time, we are waiting for the Messiah. Who is the Messiah? Who is, who is this person who is going to come? When is he going to come? There was a common search. Remember, 400 years, even before that, there were prophecies of the Messiah. 400 years, no prophetic word. So people are empty, people are dry, they are searching, waiting for the Messiah. Now, what does Andrew do? Andrew goes, finds his brother, Peter. And he says to Peter, what? Peter, we have found the Messiah. Common need. What was Peter's need? I want to know who the Messiah is. What was Andrew's need? I want to know who the Messiah is. So now Andrew got to know who the Messiah is, he goes and finds Peter and says, we found the Messiah. So you and I have this opportunity where when we are ministering to people, we can look at need, common in both together. Right? For example, it could be music, it could be reading, it could be dancing, anything. It could be games. You, you have a common interest. You bring them both together, point people to Jesus. Remember this one time I was playing chess with a friend. How many of you have played chess? Right? When you play chess, what is one of the coins that's the most important coin? The king. I was just playing chess. So I said, hey, give it to me. I got up the whole topic of the king. I said, there are two kinds of kings. He said, no, there's one king. I said, no, no. If you think about it, there are two kinds of kings. One is an earthly king, one is a heavenly king. So what do you mean heavenly king? Give me an opportunity. Now, how did it start off? Through chess. Right? It was just a common interest. Playing together. Ask the right questions, be able to uh, understand when to come in, how to come in, what kind of question, right? And when Andrew is sharing what he discovered with his brother Simon, based on common interest, both were looking for the Messiah. Eventually, Peter also came. What did he say? Get away from me, Lord, I am a sinner. Imagine, Andrew brought his brother Peter and Peter believed in Jesus as the Messiah who went on to become the greatest leader among all 12 of them. Who went on to lead the church. Andrew didn't know that. All he did was, I found the Messiah. My brother also wants to know who the Messiah is. I'll go and tell him this. Based on common interest, common search. Right? Next one. Extend, extending an invitation to one who is doubtful. Verse 43 to 51. This is uh, about... Now, let me give you a picture of what's happening. So slowly, people are believing in Jesus. One of them is Philip. Philip believes that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, Philip has a good friend named Nathaniel. Right? Now, Nathaniel was a good man, right? very honest person. And so Philip goes to Nathaniel and says, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah. Now, this is a different story. Andrew went to Peter. Peter somehow believed and he came. But here, Nathaniel is doubtful. Messiah? From where? 
from Galilee. From Galilee. Something's wrong. He was doubtful. Let's read. One, John chapter 1, 43 to 51. The next, day, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, finding Philip. He said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was, the, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophet also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathalian said. Come and see, said Philip. Jesus saw Nathalian approaching. He said to him, He truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathalian asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathalian called, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you. I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angel of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Right. So now look at this picture. You've got Philip, a good friend named Nathaniel. And Nathaniel, he goes to Nathaniel and says, Hey, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah. Oh, really? You found the Messiah? Where is he from? From Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth. He's the Messiah. What is Nathaniel's response? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, here's the thing. Nath Philip did not try to convince Nathaniel. Hey, no, really, you believe in me. I went and met him. So when I met him, this is how he spoke. This is how he looks. When he spoke, you know, he spoke with such authority. He didn't convince him anything. What did he say? The three powerful words, the same words Jesus said to, the, to Andrew, the disciple. What is it? Say it loudly. Same three words. Said, come and see. Now, this is a very important example for all of us. There will be times people are skeptical. They don't believe. They are doubtful. Don't go try convincing everyone that Jesus is the Messiah. Or go and go convincing everyone that Christianity is the best. Sometimes we don't need to do any convincing. All we need to do is let them know that, you know, maybe give them the book of John. Or maybe invite them to church. Invite them to a cell group. We don't have to explain everything at times. Now, all Philip did was, he went and said to Nathaniel, come and see. Nathaniel came. He saw Jesus. Now, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, oh, here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Now, that's a big, big, uh, you know, big thing for the Messiah to tell a man. This man, there is no deceit in him. That means his heart is pure. And then now Nathaniel is thinking, are you really the Messiah? How do you know me? And Jesus says, through the word of knowledge, I knew you even while, even before you were sitting below that fig tree. I knew you before that. That moment, Nathaniel's heart is open. What did Philip do? Did he go interpreting scriptures to him? Did Philip explain anything to him? Did Philip open the book of, uh, you know, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Isaiah, and share, you know, this is what the Messiah is? Nothing. He said, come and see. Jesus did the rest. The same way, you and I can say, come and see. I expect Jesus to do the rest. Right? So we can invite, and in, while extending an invitation to the doubtful, give them an opportunity to encounter Jesus. Sometimes we don't have to take up all the responsibility ourselves. So I always say this, there's God's sovereignty and there's man's responsibility. You understand what that means? God is sovereign. He knows everything. But God has also given us responsibility. 
that we must do. There are times God will work in his sovereign power. There are times he expects us to work. There are responsibilities we have to do. Right? Remember that example I gave? You fill the water pots, God's sovereignty. Sorry, you fill the water pots, man's responsibility. I will turn it to wine, God's power. You open, you move the stone. I will raise Lazarus from the dead. Ephesians 1 says, he has predestined us to salvation. That means he has chosen us for salvation. But in the book of James, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Man's responsibility. Get it? Right? So there's God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. At times, God will combine both of it. At times, God will say, I will handle the situation. To Nathaniel, he handled it alone. All that Philip did was brought him there. Maybe Philip was just standing back and listening to the conversation. And then he knew it. Nathaniel came to Christ. Right? So when you, you and I invite and pray, realize the power of a single invitation. Think of this. One single invitation has power in that. We don't know who we are inviting. Right? He could be the next Billy Graham. He could be the next Reynard Bonke, next great prophet. We don't know. And so realize the importance of one single invitation. Andrew invited Peter, his own brother. Peter went on to become the leader, the rock. He went on to lead the church in Jerusalem, a great apostle. If you've you read the story of uh, Billy Graham, did I give you this example? Billy Graham, as a little child, he used to go to Sunday school, and there was this old man who would come to Sunday school and teach. And the people used to ask him, you're so old, why do you come for three, four children early in the morning to teach these children Sunday school? He said, no, God has called me for this, so I'm doing this. And in one of the Sunday school sessions, one of the boys gave their life to Christ. And that boy was Billy Graham. Now, this old man did not know what Billy Graham would become. So when you and I are ministering to people, we don't judge them by what they are or what they are doing right now. You never know what they can become. Understand the power of a single invitation. Think of various situations that people go through and which provides an opportunity where, where you can invite them to explore Jesus. Mainly, people face challenges. People are asking questions about life. They have no meaning in life. People are interested in learning and exploring. Right? Nowadays, there are young folks who, who want to know more about different faiths. Right? Some of them don't want to know. Some of them want to know. So you give them an opportunity. Uh, there are there are some who are thankful and grateful for good things. Uh, some of them are in a need. So you point them to Jesus through all of this. Think of events. Now, there are some events that we put here. All of these events are what we do at APC. Pit stop, youth meetings, men's ministry, women's ministry, uh, uh, teens ministry, church camp, kids camp, kids conference many, many ministries that we have at APC. But you see what works in your place. Now, many of you are coming from towns and from villages. Uh, but you see what works in your place, right? If there are, now, for example, you can't have a youth concert in a village. Who will come for a youth concert in a village? Will people come? They also won't come. Right? So you need to think about what you're doing, where you're doing it. Right? So if I'm doing, if I'm doing a youth, if I'm doing a youth conference, it should be a town or a city. And that's where I can get people. So, so you see what works in your places. Right? Many of you are planning to start a church or you start your ministry. Uh, you see what works and come up with events, come up with conferences, programs, 
uh, and see what works for you. Now, there will be times you'll start something, it may not work, right? You can either give it some time or change it, try to do something else. Now, even at APC, over the last 15 years, there are things that we have done, things we are doing from 15 years, we are still doing it now. There are things that we have changed uh, doing, or maybe a different style of doing it, and there are things that we have stopped doing. So we need to see what works, what doesn't work. Okay, so there's a list of uh, uh, events here. Again, some of the common things would be Good Friday, Easter Sunday, Sunday services, uh, Christmas. These are opportunities to invite. Okay, think of various conversation starters. Again, um, asking the right questions, conversation starters, right? finding out what the person, other person is going through. Uh, what what is what phase of life they are in? Simple things like that. Okay, inviting people to church is one of many ways you extend an invitation for people to meet with Jesus. Most people, when you invite them to church, they will come. I would say eight out of ten, when you invite them to church, they will come. Because if it's somebody who you personally know, if it's somebody in your family or a personal friend, when you invite them, eight out of 10 people will come. There will be some of them who will not come. That's all right. But what you're doing is the moment you give them this opportunity, the door for them to receive Christ is already open. Now, here's what you shouldn't do. If you invite somebody to church, don't sit next to them and keep eating their head. No, did, did the Holy Spirit talk to you? No, did you see Jesus? See, this song is talking about Jesus. He'll remove all that. No, just leave them alone. Right? It could be anything that God can speak to them. You have done your part. Don't worry about the rest. Right? Just invite them, extend an invitation to church. But we talked about hindrances, why we don't want to invite people, why we don't want to share Jesus. Remember that? Inhibitions, fear, doubt, not knowing what to say. So sometimes here are, here are a few things. Sometimes we are too self-conscious and don't invite people. You know what is self-conscious? Self-conscious means you're worried about what people think about you. What if they think I am a believer? What if they think I am, uh, you know, a holy boy and a holy person and they don't talk to me next? That's being self-conscious. What if they don't talk to me anymore? What if they break friendship with me? What if I'm not cool anymore? Right? Now, all of that thoughts will be there, but we need to come out of that. Come out of self-consciousness. I mean, just, just, be, just be who you are. People have flaws. We all have challenges. Get over it. Overcome those challenges. Continue to walk in life. Right? Two, sometimes we are afraid to face rejection. We talked about this. We cannot control people's response. If people say no, it's all right. It's not the end of the world. Yes or no? Please come to church. No, I don't want church. I don't like your Jesus. Never speak to me. Now, it's not the end of the world. Right? Jesus won't come and take you away. It's okay. Move on. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Move on. Go to the next person. No need to sit and cry for that person. Why? Because Jesus himself did that. The Bible says that when he went to his hometown, they, he was surprised that they didn't believe. He couldn't do miracles there. What did he do? He shook the dust off his feet and he went. That means I'm not coming here. These people are not even believing. When I go to Samaria, when I go to other towns, there are thousands of people following me. My own hometown, they're not following me. They're not even understanding what I'm saying. Right? So don't be afraid for rejection. No, here's the thing. No is one of the most difficult words to either give or to take. In the English dictionary. Sometimes it's very hard to say no. Sometimes it's very hard to receive no. 
can I lead worship next week? No. I'm, is, am I a bad worship leader? I said, I didn't say that. I just said no. Right? Sometimes it's hard to say no. How to say no? What will they feel? Don't worry about that. No is no. If you have to say it, you have to say it. Right? Sometimes we are afraid that others may perceive us differently and we may lose our friendship. Now, in church, when we are in the Praise the Lord gang, that's a different story. Have you seen the Praise the Lord gang? You're not seen? Every, every time they meet, they say Praise the Lord. If, even if it's five times a day, they meet you, Praise the Lord. That's good. But what about Praise the Lord outside the church? He's a fool. He's a, you know, he's this, he's that. No, 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 no. We need to understand that when we are in Christ, we need to understand who we are. Right? These are whatever we do is an outflow of our relationship with Jesus. And I'm not saying praise the Lord is not good. It's good. We're praising God. We're greeting each other. But that tends to outflow out of church as well into our communities. Right? Inviting people. We are not forcing, we are not manipulating, but we are giving them an opportunity, right? Sometimes we are afraid we don't have all the answers. We talked about all this, right? Not all of us have the answers. We don't know the answer. Tell them you don't know the answer. I'll find out. I'll let you know, right? Next, sometimes we are too worried about the church service. What if it's too irrelevant? Oh. Now, example. You, you want to invite somebody for Good Friday service. Now, don't worry. Will this person know what is Good Friday? Good Friday, why is it good when such a bad thing is happening? Will he understand about the cross? Why they took Jesus? Why they beat him up? Why they crucified him? Will he understand? I don't know if he'll understand. Better not to invite him. I'll invite him another time. No. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about how they will understand. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. You and I, our responsibility is to invite. Let the work of the Holy Spirit, let Him do His work. We do our work. Okay? Sometimes, you know, they may not understand the prayer. They may not understand what is worship. Now, people from other faiths, see, we are used to praise and worship. People from other faiths may not be used to it. Right? So don't worry about, will they, will they understand? Will they stand for 45 minutes? If they want to sit, make them sit. It's their wish, right? So don't be in a place where, you know, we take up the place of God, right? Let Just be normal. Let them know it's a church service. This is what will happen. And allow God to minister to them, right? Important. When we want to invite unsaved friends or those who are not going to church, do not invite people who are already going to a church. Now, what is this called? We want to invite people who are unbelievers, people from other faiths. But if I go and start inviting people from other churches, what is that called? Sorry? Sheep stealing? It's like going to a thief's house and uh, robbing his uh, the things that he has robbed. There's no point. The point is, we don't want to start a competition between churches here. That's why in APC, one of the announcements that we always make, what is it? When first time visitors come, we say, if you're already part of a church where the word of God is being taught, we encourage you to be faithful there. But if you're looking for a church, come back and see this is where God wants you to be planted. If you're already part of a church, we encourage you to be faithful there. So we're not saying, leave that church and come here. This is a better place. We know everything from the Bible. We are teaching this. We have Bible. We don't want explaining all of that. If you are in a different church, be faithful to that church. And then there's a book called Divine Order in the Citywide Church. So uh, it's good to read that to understand order in the church. OK, three important points when you're making an invitation. Be simple. Don't make a big show. There's humility in simplicity. 
Okay? Let's be simple. Don't go to the person and say, hey, you're sick, is it? You come to church. That man of God will put his hand on you. You'll feel fire on your whole body. And whatever sickness is, it'll go. Now this man will come next week. Oh, really? Okay, I'll come. Now that, that man of God wouldn't even come near him. There's no fire. There's no ice. Nothing is happening. Now will he come back again? No. So when you and I learn to be simple, choose your words, choose simple words, give simple things. Don't make it a show. It's not a glamorous gospel. Imagine that guy comes and he hears about the cross and blood and all of it. Be simple. Two, be truthful. Hey, this is about the cross. This is about the Messiah. And this is what, it, uh, what we are doing. Right? Uh, it's about Jesus. And we are Christians. This is, this is uh, something that we believe in. Okay. Be inviting without coercing. Then make invitation to explore Jesus and then pray. After the first visit, pray for them. Now, one is you can pray with them. Two is you can pray for them. Sometimes they may say, hey, I didn't understand anything. What happened in church? So then you can sit with them, talk to them, explain what happened to them, pray with them. Now, so other times there'll be people who will come and they'll go. They'll never come. You know, you'll, they may not come back again. But you can pray for them. Say, God, the seed is sown in their hearts. Whatever was preached, whatever they saw, Lord, I pray that that seed will bear fruit in their lives. You're praying for them. Right? Now, after their first visit, help them to process what they saw. Help them to connect with church community if they're interested. Right? Don't force them. Don't say, please come next week also. I'll be waiting for you. You can just invite them. Don't force them to come. And three, continue to invite them if they're open. If they have made a decision for Jesus, it is wonderful to see that. That is, I think, the greatest joy. Now, for me, I have shared the gospel with many, many people. Many times people have rejected it. Many times people have accepted it. And I think the greatest joy that I've ever had is to see a person, his life is completely transformed from what he was to what God makes him. When I see a person who was a drug addict, doing drugs, parents are going, are worried he's going to die anytime, addicted to drugs, then I see, you know, after sharing the gospel, I see this person's life completely changed. No more desires of the world. No more desires of drugs or addictions. Now their heart is turned towards the Lord. And then you see them becoming leaders in the church, becoming pastors in the church. That is the greatest joy that you can ever have. The greatest joy. I tell you, because I've seen it in my own eyes. I've seen people living in complete sin. But after the gospel was given to them, their lives are changed. Now they're leading churches, leading ministries, pastors, serving God. That's the greatest joy we can see. Right? So if they've made a decision for Jesus, help them to grow in their faith. Yes, it's a joy, but we also need to help them to grow. It's like this. Think of it naturally. When a child, when a baby is born, the mother is excited. She forgets about all the pain that she went through. All the pain that she went through while delivering that baby. But, but the moment the baby is born, she's forgotten all of that pain. She's not thinking of the pain. She looks at that baby and all the joy just overwhelms her heart. But does she take that baby and keep it away and say, oh, my work is done? No. Oh. The mother takes care of that baby, nurtures that baby, feeds that baby, makes sure that baby is well protected. Right? Until a certain age, the mother has to be there at all times with that baby. The same way, when a person is born again in Christ, he's literally a baby. So you and I can nurture them, help them grow. 
help them develop right and of course we have churches we have pastors we have cell groups we have events conferences that you can invite them and you know, sometimes you can just get them to come they will learn they will grow right but remember this people learn differently right now for example if i say everyone studies psalms 91 right some of you may take two hours some of you may take one hour some of us may take the whole day we have different learning capacities right so even as we are inviting people we're bringing them to christ we journey along with them help them to grow but you give them time to grow some of them learn fast that's good some of them take time journey along with them right don't be discouraged if people are taking time All right so we'll stop here we'll get into chapter seven next class talk about connect and impact how to connect with people and how when we share the gospel we're able to impact their lives right any questions if some is uh, like i met my friend and he's not happy in his church so then i can can i invite him to my church okay so if he's not happy in his church and if he's taken time first try try to solve the problem try to find out why he's not happy right now remember we can't make everyone happy so for example the pastor may have he may want one hour of worship. Pastor schedule half an hour of worship. Now he's not happy. That's not his fault, right? He has to, the pastor saying, okay, half an hour worship, half an hour word. So you find out why he's unhappy. Try to solve the problem. If it's a problem in leadership, something that is going wrong, is, you know, it's not going right, something is not unbiblical, what you do is you can tell him, see, go and inform your leadership, right? Inform what is happening. Or go meet with the pastor, share what you what is going wrong in the church. Now, even after that, there is no change. Then he can probably go to the pastor and say, Pastor, this is what I feel. I am going to go and be part of another church. So please release me from your under your spiritual care. You do it the right way. And if I went to his church and I saw that the preaching is not good, like not good but it's a uh, it's not revelationary it's not from the word of god it is like their own thing so then what should i do you don't do anything because it's if they are if he is part of that church as a leader he is responsible for his sheep now we may know many things and i go into this church and you know if they are preaching something i have no authority to speak of that because it's not under my spiritual care. So I just keep quiet and I move on. But uh, can we share him our word like? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That you can do. Okay. Uh, Shiva Rama, do you have a question? You raise your hand. Anything else? Okay, shall we close? Does anyone like to pray and close? Go ahead. Quickly. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful teaching, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for to reveal us how to uh, evangelize us uh, how to brought people in your presence, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this wonderful time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. God bless.